Hey everyone, this is Craig Ballantyne. I'm here with Cole Gordon from Closers.io, and we're going to show you how we went from worst to first and zero to hero in sales and building out a seven-figure business so that you can scale one up on autopilot too. You ready to crush this, Cole? I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, let's go. Yeah. I mean, I remember us chatting on Instagram like three years ago or something, and then boom, you blew the business up. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, I mean, that was back in the day, man. I was just a sales rep, you know? I, I went to your Perfect Formula event. I mean, I was broke as a joke back then. Um, so, yeah, you know, it was funny. That was the first marketing event I ever went to. First event I ever went to of anything, probably. And it was yours. Uh, you let me come for free. I mean, it was, I mean, it was super impactful, dude. It was, it was super helpful. Met a bunch of cool people. Met, met Vince Del Monte way back then. And, you know, he was like this big guy. I was like, oh, my God. Now he's like one of my clients. I know it's amazing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, that's crazy. But that was like my, I was an infant back then. Well, you know, let's just jump into it. And, you know, you've walked a long and tough road to get here. You, you know, you described, uh, I think in your presentation to our mastermind, you said socially awkward, you know, started out that way. And now, you know, eight figure sales operation. Like what was, what was the quick and dirty of the journey? Yeah. Are we, are we live by the way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Solid. Um, dude, so quick and dirty of the journey. Um, I would say like, I'm sure you've heard a lot of entrepreneurs, especially really high performing people. A lot of it, like the initial drive at least comes from some sort of pain. So I was super socially awkward. I, you know, I wasn't good with, with girls and stuff. So my personal development journey first started with like fitness and just becoming good at sports and realizing, okay, I can, I can influence these outcomes. And then, you know, I was like, okay, if I could influence these things in, in fitness, you know, maybe I can get better in my social life. So I started reading, reading books on like how to be better at social life and all this stuff. And then eventually I got, I got much, much better at that. And then I was like, dude, I mean, well, there's all these business books. I'm going to start reading business books, everything, et cetera. So at the time I was uh, on track for, for med school. Like that's what I was oh, going to wow. do. And I read this book called how to get rich by Felix Dennis. It was a really, really good book. Uh, yeah. Very entertaining as well. And I remember exactly where it was when I read that. And when I read that, I just, I just knew I wasn't going to do the med school for the right reasons. I was, you know, do, going for like status and because uh, I thought that's what being successful was. And, and I thought that was how you make money and all this stuff. And then I realized all that was not true. And I realized if I wanted to make money, I should go into business. So I finished out college and dropped out. And then what I did is I was like, I'm going to start an online business, you know? And at the time, I had no idea what I was doing. I... I was maybe going to try to do something in health, but I don't know. I started blogging and I just had no idea what I was doing. And so eventually just buying courses, you know, I learned like Facebook ads. So I was like, okay, well, I have this skill. Let me try to start an agency. So got that agency to 30 grand a month. And then just, oh, nice. I, I just was not qualified to be an agency owner. I sucked at that. Um, so can that, but what I was good at was the sales. So it's like kind of by doing that, I gained another skill. And then I was like, I'm just going to, do this skill. And that's around the time when we first, first met. And so I was which, like, which I'm going to narrow down. retreat did you come to? Is that the one with Lewis? Yeah, I think was... it was the San Diego. I think it was the first one. Was Lewis House a speaker at that one? Yes. And Tucker Max. Yeah. yeah then that was the first one. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So um, that was way back in the day. And then I uh, decided to go full-time sales, tunnel vision, focus on one skill. You know, and so the first place I was at was okay. I mean, I, you know, I was making six figures, but I leads are really bad, but that was kind of a gift in itself because I was closing like these terrible leads. So that actually helped be really good. And then I went to this other offer that was a little bit better. It was like SEO agency coaching offer type of thing. And then after that, I went to traffic and funnels and that's where I really, I was already good and I got a lot better and I was on finally something like a good, a good offer. So my income went from like 10 to like 25,000 a month, $30,000 a month. And so I spent a lot of time there and I was really grateful for my time there. I did really well. I was one of the, I was basically the top guy on the team. There were some other guys that were really, really good as well. And then eventually I just kind of was at an income ceiling. So I went to start my own thing. And well, then well, I, well, let's, let me just interrupt you there. Like, you know, you were jumping from, you know, nothing to something to then 30, 40 grand, uh, a month like what were some of like one two maybe three at the most some of the biggest things that you learned in sales along the way that anybody listening can go oh man i can take that and start using it yeah have you ever read the 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 book uh is it going pro by 
Steven. Uh, Oh, it's um, Turning Pro. Turning Pro is one of them. Turning Pro. Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. Sales. Like they call it sales professional for a reason, you know? Yeah. So I was kind of just doing this at first, like, you know, and I didn't know, like I, I, at first I was like, I need to make some money and then I'm going to do my agency again. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'll kind of do this. And it wasn't until I really realized like, man, I'm going to tunnel vision and just be a freaking professional at this thing and just go all out that, uh, I got really good. So the main thing, there's certainly mechanics to sales, tactics, all of all that stuff. But anybody who's done a lot of sales knows it's also a lot more about energy, right? So really what helped me was, you know, creating a routine, waking up really early in the morning, going to bed at 8 p.m. Uh, and then every single morning, especially with sales. 8 p.m. club. Yeah, I know. So, so the thing is, I know with you, you talk about getting up at 5 a.m. And, and starting work. And like now, like I might be writing copy, I might be creating a memo for my 60 person team. So I'm all about waking up 5 a.m. getting to work. But you know, with sales, you wake up at 5 a.m. Unless you are in the, uh, you know, where would it be? Hawaii. You'd be, you'd be in the East Coast and doing sales to somebody in the UK or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you can't really wake up at 5 a.m. and start making cold calls, right? So the best thing to do is kind of rev your energy. So like I had this routine and I was so, uh, I was so rigid back then, but I, I would wake up, I'd read for 30 minutes. And I always found that getting good inputs in the morning helps you get good outputs during the day, okay. right? So it's like the same way as if you're a copywriter, you want to have a lot of inputs to formulate ideas. It's a very, very same thing with sales. Like you, if I get up in the morning and I read, uh, what was that book called? Like the 179 Habits um, Successful habits of uh, high performers. I don't know that one, but, but I, know that, I know I know Bernard has high performance habits. Yeah, that's that's a good book. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but if you read something, maybe Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink or something. Sure, or Atomic right? Habits, like stuff like that, where it's talking about how to think. You know, straight line leadership. You're, it, it, it's successful thinking. It gets it primes you in the right way. So thirty minutes, I would do that. Then I would go to the gym. And I would, you know, do like a, a HIT or some sort of like vigorous yeah. workout type of thing. And uh, what was really key during that is I would always listen to two wins every single day at one and a half speed. So I'd listen to sales calls that I had closed. Yeah. And so it's it's priming my brain on like hearing yourself take credit cards, hearing yourself win, help people, uh, et cetera. And so it's just burning. And, and I'm telling you that habit right there alone is probably probably one of the biggest any professional salesperson would do is listen to a win a day. Maybe yeah. Two. And so when, when you were doing your presentation for our mastermind, you were talking about your sales teams meetings and you guys really go over like, here's what worked. Like, let's focus on one that works. Do you guys spend, do you think that it's, you know, sometimes it's not worth spending time on the ones that you missed out on, or do you like incorporate that in some other way too? So yeah, they're, they're both incorporated. So there's a difference. I listen, I listen to wins like I listen to the radio. So if I'm going on a jog and I, I, I want to throw on a win just to condition myself to he, and remind myself, I know how to do this. This is easy. I've done this a thousand times. If I'm listening to a loss, I want to sit in front of the computer and I want to break down. Okay. Like I'm going to take notes. I'm going to, I'm going to take notes on the questions I asked. I'm really going to decipher where was the missed opportunity here? What would I have said differently? Whereas the wins, and you could do that with your wins as well, but with wins, I kind of like to do like more of a subconscious thing. It's like training your brain. It's reminding your brain. Whereas the losses, we'll get on as a team during the sales meeting, we'll review a loss. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So totally. it's losses. I want to go deeper, but wins, I just, it's like I, I'm training my brain to listen to it subconsciously. Yeah. So you're doing that. You're hitting the hard workout listening to the the winds getting it going really getting fired up in the morning yeah and then and then doing some breath work um does help with sales a lot especially i i can be a little bit like high d um on the disc you know, profile it, it, oh yeah like i'm like a 99 so um the thing is is if with sales sometimes you're gonna get frustrated with people and so i found doing some sort of like kind of comboing uh the exercise with breath work allowed me to get into a very like Zen state in a good way, which was a good energy to bring on these calls. So doing that, and then also just taking extreme responsibility for your numbers. So like the first thing I would, I would run that routine, hit the sales meeting, 
And then the sales meeting, you know, it's, it's high energy if you're on a good team. And one of the biggest things about the sales meeting is this concept called projections. So this was something that I learned from when I sold for Taylor Welch. And I, you know, I don't know if he created it, but he's definitely the one who taught me this concept. And so really there's like kind of the, the 10X mantra, like Grant Cardona stuff where it's like, yeah, like 10X, that, that's okay. But, and I think that's, it, it's a practical thing to use for thinking big. Sure. But for sales, what you want to train is being able to set an accurate projection and hit it. And it builds confidence. So if I say I'm going to do eight units this week, I do eight units, Got it. right? Or I do more, but I don't do seven. Seven is, is failure, right? And so if you can train your team and yourself to be able to say you're going to do this thing and then you do it, it builds confidence. Confidence lends to certainty. Certainty is what you're going to transfer over the phone to your prospects. You say something, you do it, right? You say you're going to wake up at 5 a.m. You don't hit the snooze, you wake up at 5 a.m. You say you're going to hit the gym at six after you wake up at five, you, 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 you fulfill on that promise to yourself. Now you can't always hit your numbers every single time, but a good barometer for your projections is about 80%. If you miss it 20% of the time, that's probably where you need to be. If you're, if you're missing it only 10%, you're probably not setting it high enough. Right. And I got that from, uh, I forget that book that, uh, the dude from IBM wrote, uh, high Andy, Grove, Andy Grove, high output management, I think. Yes. He, he talks about when setting targets, you want to set it to about to where if, if they did everything perfectly, there's still maybe a 20% chance they might miss the target because setting it that high is what will allow your team to stretch itself. Right. So that's what, you know, happened to me is, is we were setting really high projections and I innovated a lot of like, let's say follow-up strategies, um, pipeline strategies, and, and even self-generated organic strategies. Because if I just relied on the marketing, I wouldn't have been able to hit my numbers. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the stuff I teach now was stuff I innovated because of the pressure of hitting these numbers and those, and those targets being so high. So it was actually, it, it's, and that's what I try to give to my team now is setting it high enough to where they kind of have to have a little bit of innovation too. They got to get a little bit scrappy. They just can't depend on the leads that like them, you know, but it's, you know, you, you, it's 80%, right? They should hit it most of the time if they're good, you know? Yeah. So you read a lot of books and one of the ones that you talked about in the presentation to my mastermind was getting, going through ready, fire, aim by Mark, Mark Ford, who, who founded early to rise. And then you talked about the op, uh, op, the, uh, not op, optional, the optimal, optimal selling system. And we'll talk yes. about that in a second. But how did you, how did you come across Ready, Fire, Aim? And what were some of the other big lessons that you took from it? So how did I come across it? You know, back before I even went to your event, I read that book. And it was funny, like, at the time, I mean, it was super helpful. But also at the time, I was just so new. I like, I got a lot of lessons from it. But I've, I've read that book more time than I've, more times than I've read any book. Um, and I've even like recently been reading uh, it's, it's some, some different material from Mark and Agora and Bill and, and everything. Um, but biggest lessons, I mean, the way he breaks down selling something first and then uh, like so many people, they, they kind of put the cart before the horse, right? right. So it's like, you got to find out how you're going to sell the thing and how you're going to sell the thing at scale before you worry about really like the you know your LLC and your business model and this and it, you know it's just right. like you got to find out what is the scalable acquisition system that is at least going to get me to a degree of critical mass you know that is one of the biggest biggest things now at my level like I've revisited that book and I've realized now like I'll give you a more advanced takeaway is for instance um, one of the biggest things that allowed us to double well not double but when we started 2021 we were doing probably like 500 grand a month and then in December we did maybe three point two million, wow. million a month, right? One of the biggest things that helped us do that was that we repositioned my sales training into a new offer. So we sold the same thing just with a different positioning. So we sold a B2B product to B2C as a certification, same product, same sales training, but different positioning. And so what he talks about is, you know, phase two is about releasing more uh, offers, releasing more products, Right or more more front end offers that fill the same back end. So we didn't model that obviously verbatim, like we're not a newsletter. But what we're going to do probably in Q two of this year is do another repositioning, sell the same thing but to somebody else. And then another thing as well is that at a certain point, 
and this is, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily a ready, fire, aim concept, but it, it kind of goes in this, this line of what I'm talking about of decentralization is I found about six to eight person on a sales team is about the, 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 the most you can get. You know, like Jeff Bezos says that um, if you can't fit everybody around a table with a pizza, it's, it's too many people. It's the two pizza meeting. Yes. So <laughs> the thing is, is that we found we, we were hitting this ceiling at, at, at six six closers, six setters. We're, we're really hitting this ceiling. And then what I decided to do, I was like, I was like, let's just keep this team as is. Let's take the best person from the team. Let's move them over and say, dude, you're just going to create your own team. Just yeah. go at it. And so we just, and then we give him a piece. And that's the big thing is you need to give people uh, a piece of like their own profit center p and let them grow their business under your business. And, and my goal, very, very similar to what they did is with some differences, become a conglomeration of companies with many CEOs, with many profit leaders, with, with a centralized marketing team and a centralized operations team by many different profit centers within the business, yeah. you know? So um, I've, uh, I, they're actually a client of mine, Agora, at least their, their phone sales division is. And uh, I mean, it's just been a huge honor working with them and just learning. I, I've probably learned more from, from them than, than maybe anybody. You know, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, just the way that they have that set up where each one of those mini companies has potential to be bigger than the, than the original company that they, they were mini underneath. It's powerful. So let's go back to um, some of the basics, like the deep work and the power of saying no and the power of vision. How did you incorporate those things as you were growing and figuring out along the way what you could build? Right. So deep work. So help me understand the question a little bit better. So you um, obviously started out with the agency, then you went to the sales stuff, and then you saw the opportunity as you move forward on that. What was the power of you getting deep work time and saying no to a whole bunch of other stuff that came along your, in your way? And what was the power of the vision to keep you on track throughout that? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for us is, is like, I've had a ton of opportunities where and everybody says like, oh, you should take equity in this business and help them with their sales team and do a rev share with this company. And we've always just, we've all, I've always stuck to the same thing, which our mission as a company is to produce world-class salespeople. Because on the B2B side, we have more of a staffing angle. So if we produce world-class salespeople, the B2B clients win. But on the certification side, the people are coming in to literally become world-class salespeople. Yeah. So I've always centered it around that mission. And I have found that, um, and this is kind of an aside, but that mission is so much more, like it, it helps recruiting so much because people feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. They feel like they're on not just a high performance team where there's a lot of growth and really high standards, but that we're actually doing something meaningful in our industry. And I think that's you know one of the reasons why a lot of people who might leave a company who's not necessarily a competitor, but in the same industry, well, like well, we get a huge inflow of people just wanting to come, come work for us, you know? And so it really, the, the bigger things you're doing, uh, the more, uh, the easier it is to recruit. That's why like um, uh, the guy who, who owns Blackstone says that it's, it's harder to recruit for a small business than it is for Blackstone, right? It's, it's harder to start a small business than it is for Blackstone because they're doing something so big. So anyways, I've always kind of kept in their path. And I also just think that one of the beliefs that's helped me say no to a lot of opportunities is what, what happens to a lot of folks is they might hit 2 million a year and they get stuck. And they think the only way to scale their income is to start a new business or start a new opportunity or start a new profit center. Whereas really what's gonna happen is even if they do that, they're gonna get stuck at 2 million a year. Or if the opportunity vehicles may be a little bit different, maybe for that business, it's, it's three and a half million a year. Where really what they need to do is they need to focus and develop the skills that allow them to get from two to 5 million. You know, and then and then even even more so than that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, that's what I've always thought is, is I'm not plateaued. You know, I'm I'm just lacking a skill. And sure, there is a certain time where if your market's 50,000 people and you've worked with 30,000 people within the market. OK, you know, OK, fine. <laughs> right. But most people aren't 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 at that point. Uh, most people are um, they're just starting something new or getting distracted from a new shiny object because they've hit a constraint in which they don't have the skills to fix. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have seven steps of scaling a team that, you know, can also really apply to seven steps of scaling a business. And I'll just list them out here. I'm only want to cover the, the first three, but the first one is validate an offer. 
then it's validate your optimal selling system, which is a shout out to Mark Ford, then delegate the sales, you know, delegate and replicate the sales. Essentially, you, uh, you know, you have a great process to hire great salespeople. Then it's sales management, hiring a sales coordinator, identifying a sales lead, and then moving that lead into full-time management. Let's just talk about first, the first three. So validating an offer, which is probably where a lot of those $2 million a year businesses get stuck. You know, they maybe they didn't know a bunch of tactics that got them to 2 million, but maybe the offer was is just okay. And they have good personal reputation and, and the personal reputation sells the offer more than the offer. But what, what um, you know, you work with, with companies that are selling a ton, including Vince Del Monte. What's the power of validating an offer and how would anybody go about doing that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you listen to the market, right? Like the market dictates the offer and even the price to me, not, not the other way around. So I think people, you know, I think people think, you know, everybody's been through those courses and programs where they, they give you the, the Dan Kennedy smart market diagnostic questions. And those questions are great, but nobody really understands their market, you know? And I think that the number one thing to do is just get on, this is why phone sales is so great. Get on the phone with your market. You know, it's, it's easier to generate leads than to, uh, you know, sell something direct from a webinar or a sales page or whatever. It's easier to generate conversations. So I think even if you plan on selling, you know, auto webinar or sales page or whatever, it works to get on the phone with your market and understand, and understand your customers mm -hmm. and understand like, you know, what are the things that they're struggling with? Um, and it's different for every market, but like, let's say it's, it's a high ticket thing. Understand like their pains, their doubts, um, what they want, like all of those things, and then try to make an offer to them that's really the bridge between their current situation and the desired situation, period. So like to give you more, it might help people understand this if I told kind of my personal story of how we created our B2B offer yeah. is when I left TF, I kind of just was like, well, I'm just gonna do some sales training. I don't really know what that's gonna be. I'm just gonna do some sales training. So I started with training one-on-one -on -one salespeople. So we were training people one-on-one -on, -one on sales. And then eventually I kind of realized, oh, there's like more money in teams, like people were more interested in having me train their sales team than learning sales better for themselves. And it was, I could charge more. And then there's a point where I literally probably three or four times a week, I'm not even kidding, will get a DM on Facebook saying, do you know where I could find good salespeople? Do you have any good salespeople? Where do I go find good salespeople? Do you, can you refer me to any good salespeople? And so I really didn't want to get into the recruiting business at first, but I, I just was like, man, like I, I can make one post on Facebook and I could fill my sales calendar for the entire month. So eventually I listened to the market and I also kind of put together a package and an offer to where I didn't just give them the salespeople, but I made sure they were able to, um, you know, succeed with the salespeople. Because oftentimes, same way, if I give you Infusionsoft, you're probably not going to be like, if I give you Infusionsoft with no support, you probably wouldn't be able to use it if you've never used stuff like that before. But if you have a dedicated success coach, you have a manual in terms of best practices of how to use it and you know all of these different things, you're going to be able to use it successfully, right? So I kind of did the same thing. It's like, I'm going to give you the sales rep, but I'm also going to create an environment and a system and a training program and all of these things so that when we staff you with the salespeople, your salespeople succeed and therefore you succeed. And that's where a lot of people kind of mess up. But I think the biggest thing was listening to the market. And the biggest thing you could do on that is just getting on the phone. Like I know when I wrote the initial marketing promotion for our staffing, I did 30 phone calls and I just walked them through a bunch of questions, you know? And um, I don't know if necessarily the questions were super rocket science, like common sense stuff, but I just, you know, I just listened to them and I was like, okay, like here's, and you know, you get a lot of good soundbite phrases. Uh, like I had one guy tell me, I feel like I'm running a call center, not a business. So my ad said, do you feel like you're running a call center, not a business? You know, so um, I think that's the, that's the biggest, biggest thing. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely gold in the feedback you get. And like back when I was in the fitness industry for years, I was selling programs with dumbbells and body weight and I got hammered over the head with, I don't have any equipment. Oh, okay, well, you know, I'm, well here, just do have to, have, you know, for a long time, it's just, well, just do whatever you can. And then I finally, you know, it's kind of kind of got through my noggin, like, oh, just make a program with no equipment. And that one sold, gosh, exponentially more, well, maybe not exponentially more, probably like five to 10 times more and so much easier than the one that had an obstacle in the way of not being able to do it. So yeah, the, uh, the customers always have the keywords and the, and the uh, new product ideas. So then the next step after you've got the validated offer 
is the optimal selling system. Mark Ford talks about that in phase one of uh, Ready, Fire, Aim. So just walk us through that briefly. Yeah, so the biggest thing is, and, and here's the thing, and where people get hung up is they might be able to get some sales, but you need something where you, you put in a certain amount of inputs and you get a certain amount of outputs, right? So that way it's, it's scalable. Now, obviously there's exceptions. Like if you have, you know, 2 million Instagram followers and, you, and your following is insane, well, then, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're going to get away with some stuff that a lot of us can't get away with. But, um, but, but that um, itself is the optimal selling system. Well, yeah, and, and there you go, right? But you still have to validate, okay, well, are you going to sell them direct on webinar? Are you going to get them on a phone call and sell them over the phone? Then when you get them on a phone call, you sell them over the phone. What are you going to say? How are you going to price it? How are you going to position it? So it's not just that, but typically, and I got this from Alex Ramosi, he talks about uh, the six main ways to acquire clients. There's word of mouth, earn media, own media, uh, cold outbound and, and sales, affiliates, and then paid, right? So I found for higher, like high ticket entrepreneurs, the businesses we work with, paid and, uh, and cold and, and outbound are probably the most scalable. Like with paid, once you have a funnel that works, you add more ad spend, you get more output, right? With cold outbound, if we add, so our cold outbound team, uh, you know, our B2B, does most of its revenue off of ads, but about 30% maybe is from cold end and outbound. And I think eventually it'll be all cold end and outbound because it's more profitable, it's more scalable and it, ad it addresses, it's really great when there's a low TAM. So if your market is 50,000 people, ads is gonna be a little bit harder, but if you have a uh, cold outbound, 50,000 people is more than you'll ever need. So it's very interesting how that works like that. But anyways, um, cold outbound, while paid, more ad spend, more output, cold outbound, more lead gen specialists who, who curate the leads and more outbound SDRs equals, I mean, that's all you need. You get more of those, you have more sales calls. So the only other one that I would say, so usually cold outbound and paid are gonna be the most scalable for folks. The other one I would say is if you have uh, owned or earned media, like I work with, you know, Tony Robbins companies, sometimes, I mean, they might send up, if they want to sell something, they send them an email to a 10th of the list or, you know, a 20th of the list and th th that that's all they need, you know, it's just because they have such a huge brand. So if you have those things that can work, but you know, a lot of the people I'm working with are bootstrapping, they're, they're not a huge, huge name in the industry. So they got to either focus on paid or cold or cold outbound. A lot of folks get stuck with like, they might have 10,000 Instagram followers. So they're able to generate some leads, but it's like not enough for a salesperson. And if they get, if they get one salesperson, they, they don't really have enough for two and then they get bottlenecked and then the salesperson leaves and then they're back on the phone and they kind of get in this purgatory, you know, place. So that's where most folks, um, cold end to end or uh, paid is, is usually going to be the way to go unless you're really good at uh, earned media. Like you're really, you know, you have 900,000 YouTube subs. That's a totally different story. So, so the next step is delegating. And this is, a, this is just a really great general business lesson because, you know, talking to my mastermind group, you were saying, you know, the founder's limiting belief is that only I can do this. Only I can do the sales yes. calls. In 2018, I was the same. I was that way. I had, I had two salespeople and yet I was not giving them all the sales calls because I thought only I can do this. And, yeah. you know, there, but there's also the delivery that, you know, only I can teach the seminars and stuff like that. So how do you help founders get over that limiting belief that only I can do this? Yeah. Well, I mean, imagine if like somebody was like, well, only I can diagnose, you know, uh, insert whatever disease, you know, only I can diagnose. I mean, it's with anything, whether it's a, a business, whether it's a, uh, like I have a client who has a really cool offer called the Hormone Project and helps uh, women with their, their, like their hormones, it, you know, through like nutritional stuff not like traditional medicine and like even that like that can be a little bit complex but there's still a diagnostic process for them to diagnose what the real problem is and then be able to prescribe a solution because usually what anybody who comes on the phone whether it's health or whether it's whether it's business comes with a symptom level problem they think the problem is this right and the salesperson's job is to start with the symptom level problem but diagnose the real root cause to diagnose what the real problem is, what the real constraint in the business is that if fixed would allow them 
to scale to the next level and then just prescribe a solution at a high level. They don't need to know how to fix the problem. They just kind of need to know like the high level what. And with any market, there's typically like three buckets. Um, so for instance, with our B2B, either folks need appointment setters, they need closers. So it's either a staffing thing, their sales team is underperforming or their issue is time, right? In, this, in a sense of like, they're the one taking all the sales calls. They don't have time to, you know, bring on a sales rep, whatever, recruit, whatever. And then, you know, their, their calendars are packed or they're not the full-time salesperson. They're the full-time sales manager. So they're like spending all this time micromanaging their sales team. They don't have the systems for it. So really there's those four buckets. So each bucket has a diagnostic process of how to handle the conversation and help them understand what the real root cause is. And as you probably know, as a copywriter, you know, a lot of times it, it, people, people get stuck on the symptom level problem and the copy needs to reveal what the real root problem is. And then once they know the real root problem, the solution kind of just is like, bam, it just almost presents itself. But most people stay stuck, not because they know what the problem is and they don't know how to fix it. It's because they're trying to fix the wrong problem, right? They're trying to, you know, create all these operational systems when they're only at 100K a month. And what they really need to do is find the optimal selling system. They, right. you know, they really need to like stop doing like organic and get on paid. In some, in some instances. Yeah. I mean, probably the line that I quote the most from Mark's book is you need to spend, if you're not at seven figures, you need to spend 80% of your time selling. Yeah. And that, like, that's about the best business advice that you can give to most beginners because they're not doing that. They're doing a million one other things. And, you know, some people don't even sell every day. Obviously, that's not going to work. So yeah. the last thing I want to ask you about, Cole, is obviously with such a great team and a large team, you've you've got some leadership stuff down. What what's your take on leadership? Does somebody need to be a high energy person like Tony Robbins to be a leader, or is there something else that is a key component? And how do you build that into your into your business? Yeah, I don't think they necessarily need to be a high energy person. Like one of my buddies the other day was breaking down his dev team, and like you know, developers are just totally different. Kind of, kind of brains. So probably a high end energy person on a dev team would would not work. So I don't think it's necessarily that, even though it can help. Um, I would say the biggest thing, the biggest thing with leadership again, similar to sales, is identifying with your with your people, like where where are they now, where do they want to be, and helping create the scorecard or like the position in your company as the bridge from where they are now to where they want to be. So they can make the income that they want to make, they can make the growth they would want to make. You know, you also got to look at time. So like, do they want to focus on, do they have a different little passion thing they want to do? Not necessarily a side hustle, but like maybe they, uh, I had a guy who was really interested in like mountain biking and stuff. Like that was like, his, like he was hardcore into it. Uh, maybe it's a family thing. Uh, we have people who are business owners, but then they come work for us because like they're burned out of their business and they're just having, they're about to have a kid, right? So they yeah. need a little bit more stability. So it's kind of like positioning it that way. And then constantly, um, keeping up with and developing your people and keep keeping communication really, really tight. So I think another thing people um, really screw up with is, you know, I, I hate inefficient meetings as much as the next person, but most people just don't do enough meetings. Like every single person on your team really should have a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, now, if you're the founder in the beginning phases and you're doing all that stuff, you might have to do bi-weekly, but everybody should have a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, most, um, do you follow a particular system like EOS or scaling up or anything like that with the one-on-one -on -one structure with it, with your entire meeting structure. No, so not really. I mean, you know, here's the thing is those books are good. Um, I just, I don't know. Like I've never resonated with those books. And when I was at, uh, TF, like I, you know, one of the nice things of being there is I got to see how a high performance company was run. So I learned a lot of lessons. I also learned about some things I would do differently. And so I kind of learned through osmosis. And then, you know, a lot of it is just like, how do I optimize this group of people to achieve the goal? Right. And at the end of the day, I, you know, I don't think we need to add more complexity than, than there's necessary of being like, we do have a, a very specific way we run meetings. Um, like for, uh, most meetings will run like this. So like the sales meeting, the sales meeting runs daily, the marketing meeting runs daily, the CS meeting, which it, we do CS operations and finance all in the same meeting, they run daily. Then there's then the, the finance team has separate meetings and the recruiting team who does all of our staffing, they'll do separate daily meetings as well. But the structure of all of our main meetings are essentially 
we start with wins. So, and usually it's client wins. We talk about client wins, client successes. It changes the energy of the meeting. Then the next thing is I'll make any announcements that are like pertinent that I need to make. The next thing after that is we're to go over some sort of KPIs. So for instance, for the salespeople, we go around and they state uh, their projection for the month, the projection for the week, where they're at for the week so far, are they on pace? And if they're not on pace, why are they not on pace? And also what do they have in pipeline for the next seven days? Are they gonna hit projection? Do they need to, do they need to recalibrate projections? So we wanna change, we wanna have everybody have extreme responsibility of their KPIs. And also if they're not on pace, have a proactive level of awareness of why they're not on pace. Because there's no shame in not hitting your goals. Or, yeah, there's no shame in not hitting your goals, only shame in not knowing why, right? So we want that proactive awareness there. And then after projections and running through KPIs, we'll do some form of team training every single day. For, so for sales calls, we'll either do role play or we'll either uh, do a call review. And sometimes we'll break out into groups. So like the, the, the setters will go with their team lead to do their training over there. We'll go, you know, uh, I don't do these meetings anymore, but um, then we have multiple team leads. We have two sales teams. So each person will take their team and do a training. We could talk about that whole structure if you want to. And then for the CS meeting, what we do every single time is we run through the same thing. The KPI there is just upsells, right? Upsells, referrals, testimonials. Now there's different ways you could do it. You could also KPI on what's called activation points. So that could be, um, I, I just find upsells is the easiest one because usually people don't buy if they didn't get the result, especially a high ticket thing. So if they, if, they, if they bought again, they, they're probably happy. So I do it on upsells, testimonials, and uh, referrals. And so we run through those KPIs for every single person, Rod Robin. Once everybody's done, we do, a, we do a training. And what we do is call a client case study. So, and we'll do, usually do three to five a meeting. So we'll bring a client and we'll look at either their onboarding form, a specific issue that the client's dealing with, or we'll look through, um, uh, you know, we have like a sheet they fill out that has all their metrics, business metrics, and either me or the team lead for that team will, will train on like how to handle this client situation. That is one of the most productive things on a client success standpoint we've ever done. It's that little part right there. For the marketing meetings, it's the same thing. It's like wins, uh, then we'll do KPIs. So for, for marketing, there's multiple KPIs, but the main one is MQLs. So marketing qualified leads. Okay, so not total leads, but, but the MQL number. So we go through that. And then after that, we're gonna run through everything on a project basis. So instead of doing a training, which we could do, we'll, we'll go through Asana and we'll go through person by person, look through everybody's tasks. Where are you at with this? Are we on pace for this due date? If we're not on pace for this due date, why are we not on pace? Do we need to recalibrate the due date? What, were we just inaccurate with that? Or are you, or is like there a skill set issue here? And it can turn into a training. So I could go on and on about this stuff, but that's the main cadence. Is, and then we have the one on ones. And then if there's ever a new initiative, this is key. This, this actually is, this sounds so simple, but this was the difference between um, our cold end to end outbound team not working. And then in 60 days, it getting to 300 grand a month. And it's probably going to hit like a million a month by the end of the year. Just cold outbound end to end. That's it. No, no ads, nothing. And if it's a new initiative, it needs its own meeting cadence. So like if you have an existing sales meeting, you can't, and it's a new initiative, you, you can't have that in the existing sales meeting. It has to have its own standalone meetings. So for that one, they, they'll attend the sales meeting where we'll do sales training, but that new initiative needs two extra meetings a week. And the meetings are on that initiative. So for instance, we just hired an internal recruiter, like in-house. Uh, and so they're kind of building out our whole internal recruiting program. So for that, their department head and that person, they have one meeting a week just dedicated to that because we, it's, it's too big of a thing to go with, go into on one-on-ones and, and certainly on team meetings. So sometimes you need to break off to a new initiative meeting. And so that Asana, KPIs, that meeting cadence, and then just having high standards in ter terms of communication, like everybody's got to show up prepared to the meetings and it's got to be like, I, if you don't know your KPIs, if I call on you, you don't know your KPIs within like a second, um, you know, it's not going to be good. Like that, we, you need to be prepared. So they need to, they need to know those KPIs. They need to be prepared. Um, we have a laptop only camera on policy. So everybody's showing up, they're present, they're not on their phone. They're not, you know, any of that stuff. And you're going to be prepared with your wins. You got to know your KPIs in advance. If you're not on pace, you, you better know why you're not on pace. Cause that's the question I'm going to ask you every single time. Huh. 
And so these are the things that kind of keep our team in sync and, and just very like optimized, um, you know, every single month. And then at the end of the month, about like, you know, probably in two or three days, we do a meeting where we, as a whole entire team, where we recap last month, the wins, the not so good, you know, like the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. And then we do one for the entire, uh, I project out the entire next month and the things we need to focus on. And that day we run that meeting too in the morning, I'll send out a company memo. Fantastic, man. Fantastic. Now let's actually bring it all the way down just as we end this uh, call. What are the words of advice that you would give to somebody who's in your shoes four years ago, you know, 2017, you come to Perfect Life Workshop. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you say to that entrepreneur right now? Yeah. So the, the, here's the big thing. Have you ever read uh, Mastery by Robert Greene? Yes. So uh, full disclosure, I actually have not read it, but I understand the, the high level, uh, some of the high level concepts of it. And somebody pointed this out to me when I told him this before, that it was kind of similar to what he was talking about with that book is uh, you need to kind of go through a phase of apprenticeship. And so I think one of the big, and people do not, I have told this advice to people before and they don't want to hear it. Like it's, it's one of those ones that doesn't land very well with folks, but it's well, it's, it's what uh, Hormozy talked about in so many of his videos. You got to go through a period of really sucking. Yeah. You know, the, the way that he describes it, he doesn't care like when he's describing, he's not trying to sell anybody on it, but like, he's just being brutally honest. Like you got to go through a period of, of learning and you're not going to earn when you're learning at the beginning. And then, yeah. you know, everybody sees like the one or two kids. They see the one Amon Godzi that's out there. He's a young guy. Do you yeah. know who he is? I've, I've heard of him. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like he, he came with so much pain from when he was young and, and like his mom was so poor and everything. Cause he was a client of mine for a very short while. And I know his story and he shares his story all the time. Like he went through such immense pain. Like you, people can't even probably understand it because, you know, we all came from relatively normal childhoods. But he came from such immense pain that if that that pain drove him to become very successful by 18 and so many 18 year olds and 20 year olds and 25 year olds see his success and think they are going to have the success that he has. And mm. the reality is, is what you and Alex uh, and people and normal people tell people is that you're going to go through that period of apprenticeship where you're actually probably going to make less money for a while yeah. than you would at a regular job, but compounded over time, it becomes what you right. have. Well, and the biggest thing is, I would say, find an industry, keyword industry, that you're passionate about, and basically go work for an amazing, hopefully kind of startup phase company in that industry. Now, I would try to make sure like you're not going to go work for somebody that's like this pipe dream startup who just raised a bunch of money and they don't even have like, like make sure they have an optimal selling system. Okay. Like that, that's what I would make sure they have so that they're actually going to grow. They're not just like, yeah, we're a startup, but our, well, you know, put our it this way. I know, I know a, a pretty wealthy guy who had his son go and start in customer service at Agora. Yeah. So there you go. You know, it's like, go, go work for a great company. And, and you know, that company, it's a big company, but it, that's a little bit different because it's entrepreneurial company that allows a lot of upward mobility. Right. So you want to work for a company like that, whether it's a startup or somewhere where there's a lot of upper mobility. And similar to what Mark says is you need to develop some sort of high income skill. Like that should be your focus. Develop a high income skill. And, and honestly, like I know this, you know this. We want, I would love for somebody who's like actually committed and has that mindset of like, dude, I'm going to work for this company. I want to develop a high income skill. That could be sales, that could be marketing, whether that's, you know, just overall marketing strategy or copywriting or media buying or something like that. It could also be managing people. It could be uh, leading people. There, there's, there's, but focus on a high income skill because one, at the very least, you'll use that skill for a lifetime, right? If you start your own business, you'll need that skill. The other thing is as well, is that um, a lot of times that skill become a, be, could become a business in within itself, right? Like for me with, with sales, I mean, that's what happened. So that's really, really key. Um, what was the, oh, and the other thing too, is that when you go work for like one of the top dogs in a certain industry, you're gonna understand the industry super well. And part of creating a successful company is understanding the industry and the market, right? Like, so for me, I had served the market I was serving for a long time. And then that way, when I started, I knew how to position everything. 
And I kind of knew how to run the business. I, I knew a lot of these things because I was a part of a company prior. Like I wasn't doing what they were doing, but I was in the same industry. Does that make sense? Yeah, so totally. that, that helps a lot because when you switch industries, it can be difficult. You know, like if you, if I went to solar and tried to do sales recruiting, I don't know solar, you know? So I know this business model, because, right? So because that's it's why- those phrases. It's those phrases that, you know, intimately from having conversations with people in pain mm-hmm. that allow you to create those grand slam ads and, and offers. Yeah. Well, and even beyond that too, like I know, you know, because I was a part of this industry for so long, even when I was an employee, I knew like what to do to be successful, to get to X revenue, Y revenue, you know, really, really scale up. Sure. Like there's a copywriting aspect to it, but I wouldn't be able to create a product in this, in the solar industry, for instance, as good as I can in this industry, because this industry, I have done the things that these clients want to do. So I have so much more experience. Whereas like in solar, like, sure, I could maybe find out and write the copy, but fulfillment that might be tough. And, you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, if you can't fulfill and your product sucks, like that is, you know, you're not going to scale. Like it's, you're not going to be able to do it. So part of it is that as well. But I would say to come full circle is like, you got to find an apprenticeship, go for a, a, a good entrepreneurial startup, fast growing company, develop a high income skill, get to know their industry really well, and also build your network. You know, like when Jeff Bezos was working for, um, I forget the company he used to work for. It was for somewhere on Wall Street. It might have been McKinsey. Right. Well, like if you read the book, after his two, in a, you know, you could, you could say this is ethical, not ethical, whatever. But after the book, two years after his non-compete was over and his non-circumvention, he literally just took, the, I mean, he literally just, all these companies he worked for, he just took a lot of their staff, uh, which you could say is good or bad. That's just what he did. You know, and so I'm not advocating you do that, but what I am advocating, oh, I think my uh, fire alarm is going on. <laughs> false alarm. Uh, false alarm. But uh, I'm not saying, you know, poach somebody's staff. That's, that's, that's unethical. But what I'm saying is uh, when you stick in an industry, your network in the industry grows. And yeah. what happens is over time, somebody who like might've had a business, but then the business, you know, they want to, they sold it and they want to kind of, you know, now they're having a kid. They want to, they're going to want to come work for you. And now that's how you get a superstar is that network in the industry. Like superstars are going to be working for somebody else. So like when you, when you stick in an industry and you build your network in that industry, you might meet somebody in an event and three years later you get reconnected and they're kind of transitioning off and you can make an offer to come work for that, you know, or uh, for you to, them to come work for you and, and all that stuff. So I think those things are really important. And it's, to be honest, I stumbled into all that stuff. I wish I could say, oh yeah, like this was my plan. You know, I kind of stumbled into it, but reflecting back on like, well, how did I grow so fast? Like, what was the reasons? If I had to distill down a step by step, that's kind of what I did. And um, I, I think that's also a repeatable path too. You know, I think that somebody could go work for another company, learn all these skills, et cetera, you know? But it does require a couple of years of suck for sure, you know. But but don't think about the monetary value. Think about what are my skills, because eventually the market, like the market value of the skill and the income and what people are paying you, will eventually match up, right? So like when I was an employee at Traffic and Funnels, I was making thirty grand a month, but my skills were like hundred k a month skills. So when I left, I just immediately went up here, and you know so. Um, that's how I think about it. And, you know, to me, it's all about the level of value you provide and your skill and all that stuff. So. Yeah. Total, total game changer, my man. That is absolutely amazing. Cool. Uh, how can people, you know, what is your business? I wouldn't even get to the website name of your business, but you know, if companies listening to this want to hire your company, it's closer.io. Closers.io. Yeah. Closers.io. Closers.io. Yep. Perfect, my man. Perfect. I want to make sure you go to the right website, but that's, that's amazing. So, uh, so happy for you. Super excited to see what you're going to grow into from here on in, man. This has been absolutely amazing. And thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate your time. And everyone, uh, this is another episode of Early Rise Radio with Craig Valentine. We'll talk to you soon.